Hello and welcome to another deep dive. So this time around we're going to be taking a look at some advanced things we can be doing with classes. And the key focus with the stuff we're looking at here, which will be three different areas, is looking at things that will allow us to reduce the amount of code that we're writing or to enforce some constraints that ensure that our code's following particular requirements and just some general tools that can make it a lot easier for working with our code. So let's dive right on in. And the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at is we're going to be taking a look at setting up something called extension methods. So extension methods come in really handy if you find yourself writing similar code for doing a similar thing with a particular type of object. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to set up a couple of scripts. One that's going to be a cube controller script and then a, another one that what it's going to do is it is going to be our extension methods. So our transform extensions. So we generally put extensions in their own uh, particular file and we would generally set those up so we have uh, one file per, per set of sort of extensions. So for a particular given class, we would confine those to a particular file. We could have multiple files that will extend the same class. That's something that is fully supported, uh, but that's not what we're going to be setting up in this case. So let's dive on in and set this up. So I want to set up an initial scenario where a fairly typical thing of we have our cube and we are wanting our cube to be able to be moving towards a particular target, which the way we would typically set that up is we would have a transform for the target. We'd also have a speed that that's moving at. We'll make that start at two meters a second. So the, the general way we would write this is we know we've got a vector three that we can do a move towards on and that we give it our current position. We give it our target position. And then we give it the distance that it's allowed to move. So our speed by time dot delta time. And we can set our transform position to that. So this is code that we commonly write and we might be writing stuff like of this a lot. We might have a lot of things that are moving around and so we're writing this sort of setup quite a bit. But it's, there's a lot of extra things there, you know. We, we want to use often transforms because we might be getting rotation information. So there's a lot of extra bits we're having to write here. You know, move towards just the calculation but it doesn't directly apply it. So it makes it a little bit more overhead in terms of typing. So that's where transform extensions we're going to set up come in handy. So first thing we want to do is these are not based off of mono behavior. We're also going to put these in a namespace. So this is a general convention you'll see with setting up extension methods that they will typically go inside their own namespace. And in this case, I'm going to call this transform move towards. And so our class, as well as being inside this namespace, we'll make it static. And then our function also has to be public and static. Now it can return something. In this case, it's going to be a void function, but we can return things. The key thing is it has to be static. So void, move towards. So again, being an extension method, the first parameter has to follow a very specific pattern. So we write this, then we give the type. So this is the class that the extension method is going to sit on. So in this case, transform, and then we give it a variable name. Then we give our second parameter, which is going to be our target, and then speed. Because what we can do is self position. Here's a vector three, move towards, self.position, target.position, speed, 
by time dot delta time. And then with that, what we're able to set up here is this goes from being that to firstly we bring in our transform extensions. Then we can actually say transform dot move towards target speed. So because we could so easily forget things like putting in the time multiplying by the time to delta time, this means that we don't need to worry about it because we're explicitly providing the speed. So it's a shorter syntax. It's quicker to read this code. It's easier to understand. And if we're having to set stuff up, it takes a fraction of the time to write this as it does to be writing this other setup. And we'll see it works. Because we'll be able to link our cube up to our target. So call this target. And we'll link this up once we add, make sure our cube has got its script. We'll give it the target. So if we run this, we should be able to move the sphere around and the cube will move towards it, which it does. So extension methods are really handy. Anytime you find that you're writing similar code to do a similar thing with a particular class, that's a good point to be looking at an extension method, something that you could add on to the class. There is a key important constraint with extension methods to be aware of though. So we can add a method to an instance of a class, not onto the actual class itself. So vector three, our move towards is a static function. We don't need an instance of a vector three to be able to do that. So, but we can't create an extension method that is able to do like of that. So we couldn't create one that uses capital T transform because that would be the type. So extension methods only apply to an instance. They also only add methods. They can't add variables onto a particular one. In terms of how we use them, how we set them up, general convention is we always put them in a namespace. So general convention extensions go in a namespace. The class name doesn't really ever get directly used. I like to use this approach where we name it based upon the type of function it's performing and where it's going in. So we could have this, we could have multiple ones in here, in which case I'd use a more generic name. But we could also have multiple classes that are adding things into it. Then our extension method must be a public static function, can return things. In terms of parameters, the first parameter is mandatory and it must follow this pattern where we use the keyword this and where we use the type that we are adding the extension onto. And then we have to provide a name. So that pattern is a key thing that we must follow for any of the extension methods. That's a requirement. So it's an easy way to add things onto an existing class. As I said, look for cases where you're writing same code for operating with the same particular class. This is a way to reduce then the amount of code you're writing. We always want to try and have things use the smallest amount of code possible because less code means less potential for errors, means also less stuff to maintain, less stuff to get up to speed on. So it can save a lot of time there. So extension methods, really handy, super useful for stuff like of that. Another thing we want to take a look at is something called an interface. So interfaces are like a contract. When a class says that it implements an interface, that class is making a contract. It's agreeing that it will implement particular functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a interface class, I scalable. So this is something you'll see that a convention in C sharp is interfaces. The name of the interface always starts with I. So we go to this. So to turn this into an interface, well, start and update go doesn't inherit from anything. Class becomes interface. So this is our bare bones, empty version of an interface set up functions. So I want to set up something to get and set the scale. And let's set this up just the way that we normally would in any other class. So public 
Float get scale public void set scale new scale. We can see it's indicating these in white, and that is because with an interface, everything. So normally we're used to in a class, the access level by default is private. With an interface, we don't actually get a choice of access level. With an interface, everything is public. That's actually a mandatory thing with an interface. You can't have a function there in an interface that isn't public. So we don't need to specify. We also can't provide a body for these functions. As soon as I go to that, it won't allow it. So interfaces don't support having a default implementation. Now there are additions that are happening to the C Sharp language that may add in support for things like of that, but the flow on process there is as to be added to the C Sharp language, then it has to be made available in the version of C Sharp that's accessible within Unity. So there can be a bit of a time delay there. For now, what we generally assume is that when we're setting up interfaces in Unity, that the functions are always going to be public, and that we can't provide a body for those functions, we can't set up variables, things like of that. It's just functions. So, let's see how this works and where we would use this. So, cube controller. So, cube controller currently inherits from mono behavior. Now, if you've come from C, C, you can inherit from multiple things. So, the one class could inherit from 10 different things. That can create a level of chaos, and you very, very rarely see it. I, I don't recall ever actually seeing that in anything other than just a purely uh, sort of academic example as being a thing that is technically possible. A big part of the reason for that is having multiple things that you inherit from can be a real nightmare for conflicts there. Variables, functions, things like of that can conflict. So C Sharp doesn't allow you to inherit from multiple classes. You can only inherit from one, but you can implement multiple interfaces. And it functions very similar in many ways to inheritance. So I can say that this implements I scalable. And as soon as I do that, it gets grumpy at me. Because remember, interfaces are a contract. When you say that you implement an interface, you are saying you're implementing that interface, which means you have to provide these functions. And you have to provide them in a very specific way. So in the interface they are public, we must make them public here as well. We cannot make them private or protected. It's not something that's permitted. If we tried to do that, it will actually get uh, cranky at us and it will not compile. So, turn the magnitude, and this one will set the scale. So, interfaces, they are a great way of constraining how something needs to look, how something needs to behave, and that can be really powerful. And we'll see how and why in a moment, uh, because what we'll do is we'll actually use stuff to work with these scales. So in this case, we're setting the scale one times by new scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a scale manager class. That the point of this scale manager class is anything that implements iScalable, it's going to be able to set the scale of, but only for things that implement that interface. So anything that doesn't implement that, it won't actually be able to change the size of, and won't actually try to change the size of. So we'll get this set up. Now, what we might initially think is, okay, cool, I'm going to do serialize field and a list of ice scalable and call that target. And we'll also set our new scale here. So we might be thinking, yep, yeah, cool, we'll initially go with doing that. We'd normally be able to create a list of things there, but not when it's an interface. 
And an interface we might be thinking, oh, well, it's another thing that we've set up. So of course, what we just do is we have to go and say, well, that's uh, system.serializable. But that's not a valid thing for an interface. Because remember, interfaces can't store data, so there's actually nothing to serialize. So the interface, we can't have, we can, you know, a list like this, we can create one, but we can't connect it up in the inspector. So this we would have to do game object, then update the game object scales. So we would loop through all of these particular ones for each target in targets. Now what we can do is we can, so scalable interface, is get component. So just like we could do get component of a base class, we can do get component of an interface. And then if that scalable interface is not equal to null, then we can go, hey, scalable interface, set scale for the new value. Uh, we also would not be able to do a find objects of type. So find objects of type that implement an interface isn't a supported thing. And we'll see if we do find objects of type i scalable, uh, that is actually not supported. It's not a valid parameter. If we take a look at our find objects of type, has to be things that are based off of uh, Unity's object type. So we can't find things based on an interface. So interfaces, you can't just easily use that as a type in the inspector, things like that. That's something to be aware of. But let's check and see how this behaves because I should be able to connect up my cube and I'll connect up my target, but only the cube should change size because the target doesn't have anything on it that implements iScalable. So the size of the cube should change so we didn't see the size change. So if we take a look, we're definitely setting the scale. We're going through get component needs to be on a target. Very easy to miss. So with testing that, then we should this time see the cube change in size. You can see the cubes increased in size, which is good. So interfaces are a great, great way of setting up like a contract for what things have to support. And lots of things in C-sharp use it. The fact that we can for each over our list, well, let's go take a look at list, and we can see lots of interfaces. It implements iCollection, an iEnumerable, an iList. So lots of different ones that get implemented, and those enforce Many of the functions here are going to be present because of these particular interfaces, because these interfaces are saying you need to support these methods. So interfaces are a great way of setting up contracts for what sections of our code have to conform to. So they are very, very valuable in that regard. They aren't something that I find I use a heap at this stage but there are cases where I do use them. So you'll see in things like of the AI projects that I use them there to ensure that the goals follow a particular pattern, that the certain functions are always present. So that's the key area of where we use interfaces is when we're wanting to set up those contracts of this thing needs to implement this particular uh, set of functions and then we can refer to it so although we don't interfaces aren't exactly inheritance it functions in many of the same ways where we can work with them using that inherited type and it makes it a lot easier for uh, being able to have our, have our code follow particular structures and that's the reason for them is it adds structure to our code which that structure adds robustness and reliability and predictability to our code, which is really important. So, okay, we've seen extensions for replacing duplicated code working on the same type. We've seen interfaces as a way of enforcing rules and structure upon our code. So the final thing I want to take a bit of a look at is something called generics. 
which allow us to work with data in a more generic fashion. So I'm going to set up a script that is going to be demo key value storage. And I'm going to put this onto just a game object here, key value storage. So we've already used generics a lot. Things like the list are a generic. Anytime you see angled brackets, odds are we're working with the generic. Now we can have generic classes or generic functions. So they're two different things. Now this demo key value storage, I'm not something that can store kind of generalized data. So I can do that. I can set up a dictionary where the key might have to be a string, but where the type is object with a lowercase o, which that is the grand, 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 grandparent, the, the, the original ancestor for all types in C sharp. So everything can come back to being in an object. So this can be our storage. And what that will allow us to do, so in this case, I'm gonna show you having a generic function. So let's look at the storage function. So set, and we do t, string key t value. So we would then say, well, storage key is equal to value. And then for retrieving it, public void, well, in this case, t get t string key. Now this one, we do return storage key, but we need to convert, we need to convert it, we need to cast it. So that's okay, we can do that. We cast it to type. What this allows us to do then is we can go, okay, store a value. So we could say storage, well actually we do set, so I could do set int uh, test one 52. I could also just do set test two 43. So when we are storing the value, generic functions can infer the type from the parameters. So we can infer type from parameter. So in this case, it would infer that the type is int. And we can see it's telling us what one it's mapping to. For retrieving a value though, it can't infer. Retrieve a value, int stored value is equal to get. So if I just did test one, that actually won't work. It can't infer it. So it can infer from a parameter, but it can't infer from a return type. So retrieve a value cannot infer type from return value. We can just log that out. Debug log stored value. And we'll get 52 when we run it. So generic functions, this is one of the main cases where I use them is for stuff like of this, where we are needing to uh, have a storage that's able to work with more generic information. And we can see it output the 52. So generic functions, really great for that. We've used generic functions a lot. We've already used them today. Get component is a generic function. And if we take a look, get component, so we can't see the specifics that are happening within that, but we can see that it is able to be uh, retrieving stuff as that particular type. We also, if we remember, if we go and find the uh, find objects of type. So let's go take a look at this. And if we look at the particular one where we couldn't use an interface, we can restrict our functions. So our generic functions can say where the type 
is a particular one or inherits from a particular one. So find objects of type has that, so stuff has to be based off of object, which is defined in Unity. So difference between lowercase object and uppercase object. So we could restrict our key value storage functions if we wanted to. Um, we don't need to in this case, but we could. So if we were going to be doing that, we would be doing where t and then providing a particular constraint. So that's a generic function. We can also have generic classes. Now generic classes, we generally use them for storage. That is the main, main scenarios where we're often, if we're using a generic class, it's usually for storing and shuffling around information. It's usually not for operating on it. So if you come from C++, you might be familiar with templates. And you might think, looking at this stuff, templates, well, they, they look very similar to generics. They're very, very different in terms of how they work. So in C++, a template gets processed by the compiler and out generates code. And it generates a set of code for each type that it works with. Generics don't work in that manner. And that constrains the range of operations that we can do with a generic. It actually limits it quite a bit. So a generic is not able to do as many operations there with it. And a clear example of that is Vector3. So in C-sharp, we have Vector3 and Vector3int, but you'll see those are different classes, or different structs in this case. In C++, they actually often wouldn't be. In C++, there would be a template that is templated on the type. And so how it works in C++ is you set up the type and then based upon how you are using it, it will generate code and then it checks at that point and says, yeah, no, this, this code, that it's generated bad code. Whereas C Sharp does a lot of that checking earlier, so that means it will run into those problems earlier. So something like of a, you know, a generic version of a vector 3, you're not typically going to see, because while there are things you can do to make that work, they will have a performance impact, and they'll result in a lot more complicated, messy code, so you won't typically see them. But let's see what it looks like when we set up a generic class. So I'm going to create a, another file for this, and generic class demo so this won't be based on mono behavior. It will simply be like of this. But again, much like the function, we can indicate t and we can also indicate constraints. So where t and then we could provide things like you know, maybe it has to implement system i comparable, for example. So we can provide constraints there with it. Uh, we can't, however, do constraints like, oh, okay, well, it has to be an in. For a function, that would be valid. For a class generic, it's not. Class generics, as we can see, it has to be an interface or similar things like of that. So, you know, maybe we could try, you know, because it is saying type, but it's not going to actually work for us. So, we're constrained often to what we can restrict it to. That also means we're constrained on the operations because the operation, whatever we indicate, has to be valid for that particular thing. So, for example, let's say we've got a t value and then we have public t squared. I cannot do this because I haven't constrained type here and I can't really constrain the type here sufficiently for this to be valid, which means it's trying to be able to make this work for anything because I could pass in a float or a string or a list and that would make no sense. So where is C sharp? So C++ if we ran this, it would generate that code and it would say, you yeah, know, this, this template is trying to do something invalid for this particular one. C sharp puts, puts that sort of check earlier and it says, no, you, you, you actually can't do this. I'm not even going to attempt to compile. 
So we're quite constrained with uh, generics and that's why generic classes, you will typically see them be used for things like of storage. So where they take information in and they're holding that information, they might shuffle it around, they might be sorting it, being able to provide it back in different ways, but they're typically not changing that information. They're not accessing the internals of it. And that's because of these constraints that we run into with generics. So, you know, that's where we could have something like a uh, you know, serialized or actually demo dictionary dictionary. And we could have a list of T and that's our keys and then a list. We need something for our values. So we can say list KV. So the actual word there, the letter doesn't actually matter. T is just the default uh, that we normally go for. It's the convention. If we could do something like this, a demo dictionary, and then we could be storing values. So for example, we could have a public void set and that could be having k, so this would be a set. And if we look, we do k key v value. We don't need to put in angled brackets again because they're already implicit as part of this. So then we could check, okay, well, uh, your keys index of key because it might already exist. So I index if the index is greater than or equal to zero, then values at that index is equal to value. Otherwise we'd be adding it to the end. So we would do keys add key values add value. So this would be a way you could have something that is a, a dictionary that you might be able to then more re readily sort of serialize it, store it in the inspector, things like that. Now, I would be very cautious with doing things like setting up your own custom dictionary because the built-in classes are well tested, really robust. I would not be setting up your own custom one unless you really, really have a good reason to be doing so. I'm setting this up because this is a good illustration of what we can actually be doing with these sort of classes. Because I could then in start here, I could say, okay, well, demo dictionary string int test is a new demo dictionary. And I could go test set, and then I want to set test key to 55. And that will work because we've provided the right types there. It'll be able to actually set those. So generic classes, I find I don't use particularly often. Now, in this case, we're getting a null reference because we need to make sure in our one here that we are newing these. So once we've got those nude, they're set up. Um, so yeah, generic classes, I really don't use a lot. I use generic functions quite a bit. Uh, things like for that key value storage, obviously when we've got versions of things like get components, stuff like of that, really commonly used but I don't find that I use uh, generic, fun generic classes much at all, mostly because their, their purpose is about storage. They're storing information, so I don't find them often needing to write custom storage ones there. So just to recap on the key things that we've got. So we saw extension functions. So extensions are, allow us to add additional functions to an instance of a class. And they are really handy when we find that we're writing the same code for a particular type. So it allows us to remove that duplication and makes our general code a lot simpler, as we saw with the move towards function.
We then had a look at interfaces, which interfaces, we follow the convention of the name starts with I. Interfaces are a way of setting a contract down for if you're implementing this interface, you're required to implement this function, this function, and this function. So it allows us to write code that can make assumptions there. That's why interfaces get used for being able to enforce rules for something being able to be compared, so sorted, or something being able to be iterated over in a for each. Interfaces are used in that regard. And then finally, we saw extensions, and we saw, sorry, we saw uh, our generics. So in particular, we saw generic functions, which are really handy, and which we use a lot for things like get components. We've already used them for a bunch of scenarios. And we saw generic classes, which we don't tend to use very often because they do have some restrictions there in that we generally, when we're setting up a generic class, it works with the data, not on the data. So it stores, shuffles, moves it around, but doesn't actually modify the data. That's sort of the key thing there when we're looking at generic classes. So we don't tend to use those particularly often. Uh, so the audio did get slightly corrupted, so I've had to re-record that. The full code for this project is available up on GitHub, and the link to that is in the description below. As with all of the projects, you can use that code in any of your own projects, whether those are commercial or non-commercial ones. If you've got any questions, chuck in a comment below. If you found the video helpful, then please do chuck in a like and subscribe. It really helps out. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and the link for that is in the description below. Bye!